The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Con Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series. My name is Mardu. I teach Tian and Republic in China at the Department of History here at Cornell University. I'm serving as the director of the CCCI series in fall 2023 with the theme, The Central State and All Under Heaven. Launched in 2015, this lecture series has brought hundreds of leading scholars from various disciplinary backgrounds to share their cutting edge research on China with Cornell students, faculty, and the general public. This series is sponsored by the East Asia program. Here, I would like to express my gratitude to the co-sponsors of this series in fall 2023, the Levinson China and Asia Pacific Studies Program, the Department of History and the Society for the Humanities at Cornell. It's a great honor for me to introduce our speaker today, Professor Nicola de Cosmo. Professor de Cosmo is a Luce Foundation professor in East Asian Studies at the School of Historical Studies at the Institute for Advanced Study. Professor de Cosmo received his PhD from Indiana University in 1991. He taught at the University of Cambridge, Harvard University, and the University of Tathbury before joining the Institute for Advanced Study in 2003. He is one of the most renowned historians who study China's connection within Asia from prehistory to the modern period. He is the author of several influential books, such as Asian China and its Animes, The Rise of Nomadic Powers in East Asian History, manchu mongol Relations on the Eve of the Qing Conquest, and The Diary of a Manchu Soldier in 17th Century China. His most recent book, published in 2022, is in Italian. The English translation um, which uh, Professor De Cosmo has very uh, kindly provided me with the English name because I cannot read Italian. Uh, Venice and the Mongols will come out in, uh, was published in Italian in 2022 and will come out in English translation next year. This, uh, this book studies the relations between the Mongols and the maritime empires of early modern Italy. And uh, Professor De Cosmo has edited many volumes including Military Culture in Imperial China, The Cambridge History of Inner Asia, Political Frontiers, Ethnic Boundaries, and the Human Geographies in Chinese History, Empire and Exchanges in Eurasia, uh, Late Antiquity, and most recently, Rebel Economies, Warlords, Insurgents, Humanitarians. His recent research focuses on environmental history. He pioneers the use of proxy data from climatology and other paleo sciences in the study of world history, the rise and fall of empires in Inner and East Asia in particular. It's a great honor for me to have, uh, for us to have Professor De Cosmo on campus. He will talk on the Qin conquest as just war, Manchu arguments and the European perception, uh, reception, which is very relevant to scholars and observers of China today in the era of the rise of the central state under all under heaven. Um, let's welcome Professor De Cosmo with warm applause. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Mara. This was a Great introduction. Thank you, Amala, for the great organization. Thank you all for, for coming. And, um, you know, I don't mind being interrupted. <laughs> so if you really have an, uh, a pressing questions, just raise your hand and, and I will try to address it even during my, my lecture, which um, uh, is on a topic that um, I every now and then go back to. Uh, because I, I love it and because it's uh, something that always uh, um, surprises me. Uh, me. You can always find new things when you study the origin, uh, the genesis, if you like, of, of, the, of, the, of this Qing dynasty that's ruled China. It's so important in Chinese history. 
But I was uh, last at Cornell over 20 years ago uh, in October 1997, and I also gave a talk on the, on the Qing dynasty, which was called, uh, Was the Qing a Colonial Empire? Question mark. We still don't know. <laughs> There's still a question mark there. Um, but since then, over the past 20 years or more, much has changed in Qing studies, as you may know, uh, especially in relation to how we see the Qing, this important period in Chinese history. We can see it from a Chinese perspective, we can see it from an Inner Asian, sort of Manchu, Mongol perspective, and we can see it also very interestingly from a world historical perspective. In Europe, the Manchu conquest of China had enormous resonance in the mid-17th uh, century. It was regarded one of the most explosive events in 17th century sort of world history as, as they understood it. In any case, you know, the question of how a small marginal people divided, not particularly sophisticated, could rise in the space of two generations to conquer a mighty, you know, if somewhat troubled <laughs> empire uh, and continue to rule it until the dawn of the 20th century is still a question that historians have not been able to answer and, and, and explain. So, you know, think about the big questions in Chinese history. This is one of them. Um, when we speak of the genesis of, the, of what some people call the Ming-Qing transition from the Ming dynasty to the Qing dynasty, I assume you all know more or less when they are, what historians normally talk about is really the fall of the Ming. Far more than they do talk about the rise or, or genesis of this Manchu power that eventually will conquer China. The explanations about the fall of the Ming have been based on several theories depending on what specific crisis the Ming were facing we might regard as more or less consequential to the gradual failure of the main government to respond to mounting crises and retain control of the state. Lately, and that's in part why I've been in going into uh, paleo environmental studies and ecology and, and, and paleo climate and so on, is because uh, the um, search for a dominant primary cause as focused on 17th century climate change. So climate change, we are going through climate change now. There was also climate change in, in the past. Uh, climate change, and, and, and this theory has been supported by a large number of studies that supposedly explain the natural disasters in China, especially in the 1630s, just before the fall of the Ming, on the basis of the global cooling associated with the so-called Little Ice Age. Uh, my own collaborations with the paleo uh, climatologists have been have persuaded me, let's say, that th th this, uh, this uh, causation arguments or causal arguments based on climate variability can be difficult, s sometimes seriously flawed. So I don't know whether the climate explanation explains anything really. But at any rate, most narratives of the Ming-Qing transition focus closely on the Manchus only just before or after 1644. So after they entered, uh, they entered um, China. And also they present them as the last in a series of so-called conquest dynasties that periodically ruled over part or the whole of China. The Liao, the Jing, the Mongol, etc. Well, not etc. This is it. <laughs> um, the Manchus are also uh, said uh, often to have been made more effective in conquering China by a pro previous process of so-called Sinicization, uh, becoming more Chinese, that enabled them to develop the tools of statecraft needed to govern a large empire. By and large, the prevailing narrative of the rise of the Manchu focuses on the military success 
and territorial expansion of these, of these people, um, which allowed the consolidation of a Manchu state, let's say, in the northeast of China, and um, uh, followed by a sort of opportunistic, let's say, move to enter China when the Chinese emperor committed suicide and there was no longer a, a Ming emperor on the throne. Uh, they were helped also in this uh, enterprise by several Chinese military and civil officials who switched sides and decided to, to, to go over to the Manchu side, to the Qing side. But all of these studies <coughs> have really not produced a serious general theory. There are many, many studies that focus on specific problems, such as uh, uh, specific problems of the Manchus. These are all the crises that apparently beset the Ming dynasty at the end, and, and the last, re the last uh, so-called crisis is the rise of the Manchus, but it's just one of them. Uh, and doesn't really explain why the Manchus became so powerful. Now, there are, as I was saying, there are many studies about specific questions that have to do with, I don't know, the Manchu military, their culture, their uh, um, uh, uh, economy, uh, and so forth, uh, their diplomacy, but they don't have, uh, um, they have not produced a general theory. What, I mean, what do I mean by general theory? Uh, I mean an explanation that takes into account all of these uh, uh, aspects of the rise of the Manchu and, and, and considers them sort of holistically in one, in one general theory. So um, am I trying to do this today? No, I'm not going to present a general theory, but I'm going to present something that um, uh, is part of po a possible general theory, in, in any case, something that um, people have not focused on before. But anyway, uh, without getting ahead of myself, um, when we look at Manchuria in the early part of the 17th century, let's say circa 1600, uh, we see a kind of archipelago, if you like, or uh, of several states, several nations, to the northeast of the Liaodong Peninsula. You can see the Liaodong Peninsula, like the Jenjo, Hoifa, Hada, Yehe, Ula, etc., etc., Haishi. Um, and they are kind of hemmed in by a number of people and, 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 and political powers, like Korea, the Ming Dynasty, and the Mongols. So um, they were these pre Manchu people, known as Jurchen, where uh, relatively few in numbers, maybe 400,000 altogether. Uh, and their economy was pretty limited. Um, demographically, the uh, population of southern Manchuria into the Yalu River and, uh, and um, yes, east of the Liaodong Peninsula had grown through the Ming Dynasty, but still there were not so many people. And it had grown because they were attracted by economic opportunities, in particular trading with China the products of their you know, hunting-gathering uh, economy, so the forest economy, if you like, uh, ginseng, pelts, furs, uh, pearl rivers, honey, and so on. All of these products were sold on Chinese markets. Um, now, the rise of the Manchu starts in the late 16th century with the complex process of state building initiated by a guy that we can consider a, a frontier uh, um, warlord of sorts. Huh. I missed this. Okay, um, so th these are the many aspects of uh, pre-Manchu uh, or, or let's say pre-1644, pre-Manchu conquest uh, um, uh, elements that we should consider when we look at the rise of the Manchus. So we have the military expansion with all of these different uh, the separate aspects. We have the economy, we have a political military structure, we have a social structure. And also we have 
a ideology of state building, if you like. You know, how to go from a tribe, if you like, to a state. How do we go from, from one uh, level of, uh, of a political organization to a higher level of a political organization? That's, and also how to uh, structure foreign relations, for instance, and a number of other uh, aspects that have to do with the expansion, like territorial expansion and uh, economic expansion of this new state that was um, emerging. So this is the ideology side, and today I am just looking at one thing, which is a novel thing in Chinese history, actually. There is very little about you know, how the Chinese justify war, going to war. Uh, and the Manchus invented a kind of just war doctrine, which we will see in the course of this lecture, seems to have been very important in furthering their position, their political position in, uh, in, in Northeast China and allowing them to um, consolidate, to consolidate their, their power. So um, some elements are the public proclamations that Nuhachi, this frontier warlord I mentioned before, uh, very important, um, and uh, which is a document referred to usually as the seven great grievances. Um, there is a claim for an heaven-granted right to wage war on the enemies, uh, and this is a, a very important part of uh, Nurhachi's propaganda, especially in the war against the Ming. And then we, we looked at the, you know, who was listening? Who was this propaganda addressed to? And how did these people receive it? Remember, these managers are operating in a very complicated political neighborhood. They have enemies uh, internally, you know, other Jurchen are uh, their enemies. The, the Mongols are their enemies, the Ming are their enemies, the Koreans are their enemies, so it's complicated. And how do they negotiate their diplomatic, political, and military position in this situation? The just war doctrine may enable them, may have enabled them to do so. Um, and this aspect, that is the ideological aspect of the rise of the Manchu also, I would say has not been uh, study, studied sufficiently anyway. So, Nuhachi, Chin Taizu, um, in a classic painting. Uh, he, he developed what I called uh, a concept of uh, just war, uh, or a just war doctrine, or a just war theory, whatever we want to call it, in the context of a war that the Ming had declared against him. He was not the first one to declare war to the Ming. I think the Ming <laughs> declared war to, uh, against him first. And this is, again, why they, the Ming declared war, because he had asserted himself and his, let's say, nascent rising state as an independent kingdom. So a move from being a tributary kingdom to the Ming court, you know, paying homage and recognizing the superiority of the Ming court, to being a sovereign independent state. That would not be tolerated by the Ming dynasty. And so the Ming decided to attack him, but before they actually attacked him, he decided to go forward with this uh, just war proclamation, let's say, why he, to justify his war against the Ming. So we have several documents that, that uh, explain the foundations and the key uh, aspects of this new doctrine. And again, I want to underline the fact that this is something really new, not only in the, let's say, in the Eurasian context, the Mongol, the Manchester, but also, I think, in the Chinese context. 
And, um, and another important thing to notice is that this declaration, this manifesto, became also a kind of template that was reused several times, also uh, uh, again in the war against the Ming, but also in the war against Korea. So it, it becomes a kind of general practice uh, to justify to justify one one's war uh, one's war. Um, okay, which uh, now this is the text of this document called the Seven Great Grievances that was issued, proclaimed, announced on the seventh of May, sixteen eighteen. Um, the Ming at this time were gathering a very large army to attack and annihilate, annihilate uh, Nuhachi. So um, the main, I should really read so that I don't get lost. Um, this is uh, number six, right? Yeah. So. Um, the Seven Great Grievances has been translated and studied before. I'm not the first one to put up this uh, translation, but the first one to translate it was a Japanese scholar called Oshibuchi Hajime, and then Giovanni Stavi, an Italian scholar, also studied it. Um, now, the early studies of this document focused on, let's say, the historical context. Uh, what are the episodes? that Nuhachi is referring to. Uh, is there an actual historical uh, uh, ground for, uh, for these claims that he is making? But beyond that, I think that this document reveals really a new stage in Nuhachi's relationship with the Ming, and a new stage in which Nuhachi tries to establish you know, what is his position in this not only in the war against the Ming, but I would say also in the general new world order <laughs> that he was, was anticipating, he was envisaging, let's say. So the first claim is about the assassination uh, of his father and grandfather. His father and grandfather were killed in a, in a skirmish, I guess, uh, with uh, with some other Georgian people uh, leaders, but supported these people who killed them were supported by the Ming. So what he is claiming is, although I didn't write it there, um, is, is oh yes, in the second in the second um, in the second uh, uh, grievance, he says that you know he overlooked this. Uh, uh, crime. He overlooked this crime because he wanted peace. So it's very interesting to say that he is really, his intention he is to restore or retain a peaceful relation with the Ming. However, the Ming violated the borders, violated treaties, violated oaths, and so on. So these are the basic claim of these uh, uh, three, uh, three grievances that the Ming do not respect Manchu sovereignty. Um, now, we, if you think about you know, how he's trying to position himself from being a tributary state to be uh, an independent state, a sovereign state, now this is the this is the uh, uh, main objective, uh, main goal of these claims to disassociate himself from a tributary relationship with uh, with the Ming, and say, you know, you need to respect our oaths, you need to respect our treaties. I'm just like you. I'm an independent sovereign state. So this is the main claim. Um, the fourth grievance is slightly different. Now, Manchu diplomacy was pretty much about, you know, based on intermarital uh, uh, relations established with other members of the Mongol or Manchu aristocracy. So this marriage diplomacy was extremely important to forge new alliances. The Ming uh, interfered 
with this diplomacy. So a, a, a princess or, or the daughter of a Mongolian prince that had been sort of promised to him a, a, as a wife in the context of this uh, marriage diplomacy uh, was not eventually uh, delivered <laughs> because the Ming interfered and said, no, you cannot make an alliance with Norachi. So, so that's another problem. Now, um, uh, uh, again, he is claiming a sovereign right to conduct his own alliances and his own foreign policy. Um, number five, number five is extremely important. We will look at it a little bit later on but this is about economic development. The Manchus were going through a hard time, food shortages and so on. So they were trying to open up new lands close to the Ming border and uh, that settled some people there, farmers, Manchu farmers and so on. The Ming that come into these areas and cleared them, you know, sort of... Um, uh, and, and, and prevented the Manchu from harvesting the grain. So um, this is this is a, a, another interference to prevent the Manchus to, from developing economically, and also they supported the direct enemies of the Manchu, another uh, uh, another Manchu tribe. So all of these all of these accusations are about really uh, building uh, 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 himself as, a, as an independent country. But the seventh is different. In the seventh grievance, there is a much, much bigger claim. Essentially, Nuhachi is saying, well, to the Ming emperor, well, you think you are the son of heaven. You think you have the mandate of heaven. But I think I can also challenge your mandate of heaven and become the next son of heaven, the next emperor of China. So there is a whole prefig prefiguration of a Manchu rise that would eventually or might eventually conquer the Tianxia, you know, the uh, all under heaven. Uh, and in fact, there is a Manchu word that means all under heaven that is, uh, is, is being used in this context. Um, and he says specifically, why should I alone be placed outside this divine law? Why am I not supported by heaven? Should, why should I not be supported by heaven if my cause is just? Right, this is the premise. If my cause is just, why should I not be supported? And, uh, and so he is making a very big, somewhat arrogant <laughs> claim that now how the Ming looked at him where it was really completely different. Uh, and uh, for the Ming, he was a rogue uh, tribal leader in, in, in the boonies, right, in the, in, the, in the provinces, and he had no standing whatsoever to challenge anything. Also because the Ming were not in a crisis yet, and they certainly had not lost the mandate of heaven or anything. So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting that he's making this very explicit challenge to the Ming emperor at this stage. His son and successor, Hun Taiji, um, reissued these seven great grievances with some changes in his own, uh, you know, after Nohachi died in 1626, he succeeded the, uh, to, the, to the throne after some time. And, um, and, and then he resumed the hostilities against the Ming and also against Korea. Korea was in, uh, invaded twice by the Manchus, 1627, 1636. And in 1627, this template of the seven great grievances was reissued. And, uh, and there is this, again, this very threatening, very uh, um, uh, openly uh, offensive language against the Ming Emperor uh, uh, in uh, in uh, um, another version of what we've seen before, you know, grievance number seven, where he says, "You call yourself you, being the the 
been China, you know, the Ming Empire. You call it yourself the Middle Kingdom, therefore you should occupy the, main, the middle. By that you mean the correct center and observe justice, implying you are not a just power, a just emperor. Yeah, I am on the side of justice, you are not. So you are going to be punished. Um, there is also a different version of uh, what we have seen before about blocking the economic development of the Manchus. And uh, this uh, more detailed grievance uh, also uh, referred to um, specifically to a stele that had been placed to mark the boundary between Manchuria and uh, and in China, apparently the Ming soldiers came and just moved it arbitrarily uh, by uh, 30, 30 li, uh, grabbing the land that the Manchus were cultivating you know, had settled. So again, uh, the real problem here in this area, by the way, uh, which is in between, let's say, in between the Ming and a kind of uh, frontier zone, <laughs> let's say, that the Ming claimed was Chinese territory, the Manchus claim, no, this is open territory and we can settle it. Um, but the Ming had uh, entered it and, uh, and, and cleared it of all the Manchu uh, farmers. So um, the accusation against Korea, where uh, that I referred to before, uh, have the same general thrust. They tend to present the Manchu as an independent political entity that was entitled to, um, was entitled to deal with Korea as a sovereign nation. Uh, it also implied that Korea could, if it wanted to, act independently of China. Now, Korea was a tributary state of China. They, they were subordinate to the Ming. But according to the Manchus, uh, the Koreans um, should take responsibility for their actions themselves. They could not just say, oh, well, we, the Ming told us to do this. And they were accused of two crimes. They were apparently harboring a, a kind of guerrilla, Chinese guerrilla leader whose base was just on an island half off the coast of Korea who had uh, led uh, like commando incursions in Manchu territory. Um, and harassing the Manchus, and it had been really difficult to deal with. So the Koreans were accused of protecting this guy and, uh, and, uh, and harboring it. And the second, uh, um, um, and, 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 and the, the second offense it was, as I said before, that um, they were doing China's or the Ming Dynasty's bidding all the time. Uh, in fact, in fact, the Koreans had also participated in this expedition, Ming expedition in 1619, meant to destroy the Manchu, the Manchu state. So, but, you know, these type of accusations are milder than those, I mean, these type of crimes are not quite as serious as those that the Chinese apparently had committed and seem to be more like, you know, light offensive offenses, which should not rise to the level of a cause for conflict. So it seems to be more like a pretext. But the fact that they are using this template of the seven grievances seem really to, uh, meant to uh, confer some kind of authority and some kind of legitimation to this declaration of war. So um, now, after uh, now, if you know what is going on here, uh, after the Manchu uh, resisted this uh, uh, Ming expedition and uh, were able to repel, you know, the Ming army. In fact, they destroyed the Ming army. Uh, immediately afterwards, in 1620, they invaded the Liaodong Peninsula and occupied it. This was the first. Um, real occupation and conquest of Chinese territory. Now, between 1623 and 1626, we don't know exactly when, uh, another document was uh, compiled. 
which expands and explains some of the Manchu thinking behind this just war doctrine. And especially the fact that, you know, according to Norachi, if you are in the right, if you are a virtuous leader, if you are a righteous leader, then heaven will support you. And, and there is a long list of people, I mean, many more than those, but em you know, from Emperor Shun, <laughs> the, the mythical emperors, to, uh, uh, to many others. Qin Shi Huangdi was disapproved by heaven. You know, some, some people were, were arrogant and guilty of various crimes, and they were punished by heaven, but others were actually virtuous leaders and were favored by heaven. And um, at the end of each of, each of these li little stories that are uh, um, extrapolated from various Chinese sources, you know, dynastic sources, as well as, you know, warring state, Zhou period. So clearly there were some Chinese involved in compiling this, this list. But essentially the idea was that no matter how small, how weak, how marginal you are, if you are a virtuous leader, heaven will support you. Cao Cao had a smaller army, but yet he won a victory. This is you know third century uh, AD because he was a virtuous leader. Therefore, he was supported by heaven. Uh, so this this type of this type of collection collection of cases was all meant to prove the point that you know. Uh, even if you are a very, very small, insignificant state and, and, and a marginal uh, place, uh, and small people and so on, that doesn't matter. All that matters is that you are a just leader, a virtuous and righteous leader. Um, So the argument for a just war, uh, just to sum up here, uh, which I presented with these two documents, right? The, the declaration, the so-called seven grievances, and then the other proclamation uh, written later, which was written, by the way, in Manchu. And uh, the Manchu document was discovered not so long ago in the Guimet Museum in Paris. Uh, we, we, we knew it from a, a, a Chinese translation, but we didn't know exactly when it was compiled. Now we know. And, and so it goes back to Nuhachi's period. Now, the argument was, was for a just war, I think, can be summed up in uh, three points. One is that um, a legitimation for war, you know, that, that Nuhachi was... Um, a legitimate, a legitimate uh, leader, a, a legitimate sovereign, and he had a good cause for waging war against China. And uh, you know, if in, in Chinese history there is a kind of equivalent of this just war theory, which is usually referred to as Ibing, uh, righteous <laughs> arms war battle, <laughs> whatever. Uh, and but but the meaning is very specific. Ebing is a punitive action, specifically uh, authorized by the emperor against somebody who rebels against the emperor or threatens the stability of the empire. So that's Ebing, and uh, in that sense, it was legitimate. So what the Chinese were doing against the Manchus was Ebing, right? Well, Punishing a rebel, essentially. What what uh, uh, Nuhachi was saying is, well, my my war is more just <laughs> than yours because I have Tian Heaven on my side because I have suffered an injustice. I suffered of several injustices. Uh, then it was also meant to establish his own sovereignty. Uh, the state, as such, was. Uh, um, no longer, as I said before, a tributary state was an independent state, and in a sense, in a sense, this just war theory. If we look into it, 
uh, also tries to redefine or tries to anticipate a, 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 an attempt, at least, a challenge to the existing world order. So changing the um, authority, uh, you know, possibly replacing the authority of the Ming emperor. So it, it, the, the, the just war doctrine is, in effect, a kind of contestation of the current world order. And, uh, you know, a, 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 which is incredible, a kind of prefiguration of, of the order that we got. Now, if we think about 1644, the, the Manchus waited and waited and waited, waited until actually the, the, the uh, uh, mandate of heaven seemed to have slipped away from the Ming. They didn't challenge them before, but at that point in 1644, when Beijing was invaded by Li Zicheng and the peasant armies and people were being tortured and, and, and slaughtered in, in Beijing, and the same uh, Chinese generals like Wu Sangwei from the, from the Northeast was joining the Manchus in order to vindicate the, uh, the Ming emperor, then the Manchus found themselves in a position to say, well, we are now a legitimate power that can replace, as we have been saying for 25 years, right, since 1619, literally 25, 25 years. So it's very interesting how you can see the development of this just war theory as something that then bears fruit at you know, when actually the Ming are no longer able to, to hold the state and present the Manchus, therefore, as legitimate pretenders, legitimate successors. This is the text uh, in the so-called Joman Jodang, or uh, old uh, Manchu script archive. Um, well, maybe we have talked about what the purpose of the Just War Doctrine, but who was listening? To whom was it addressed in, you know, in the late 1610s, you know, 1619, 1620, 1623, 26? Who was listening to this? Or to put it in a modern term, what was the audience of these, uh, of these uh, proclamations and... Uh, and uh, I need to, just one second, I think this is it, yeah. Um, let's go back for a moment to when it was issued. This was a moment, as I said before, of extreme danger for Narachi. Had he not won the Battle of Shahu in 1619, his kingdom was done. He would have been killed with his whole family and so on. Uh, that was the purpose of the expedition. So it was a moment when he could be totally annihilated. Um, there was growing tur turbulence, political turbulence. So what he, he probably wanted to do was to assert his uh, independence once and for all and consolidate and gather all of his troops around him in an effort to resist the Ming telling people we are on the side of right and we are going to win. So energize his own field. This is probably what he was doing at some level. But also he was um, drawing a line between all the Manchus and probably the Mongols and the Ming state. Drawing a line and saying, well, either you are with me or you are against me. This is, there is no longer, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, line in the sand and uh, there is no way back, no way of turning back from, from here. So um, that was also perhaps, a, a, but did anyone care? I mean, when he made that, that pronunciation, um, I think we can just speculate at this level. Um, we don't know exactly what the answer or reply or response of these people 
uh, that he was talking to, mainly his own Manchu people, as I said before, was. Um, let's try to speculate about some people who may have been listening. First of all, um, well, not immediately, but in the 19, in the 16, uh, uh, 20s, early 30s, a number of uh, Chinese generals defected to the Manchus, and also a number of civil officials defected to the Manchus when they started to create a new government in the Liaodong area. They moved their uh, capital to what is today Shenyang, and they had a new government, uh, which was partly uh, um, modeled after, fashioned after the Ming government. So they had, so these people, these dissidents, might have bought into that propaganda. Uh, it's speculation. But certainly, if you are going, you are disaffected, you know, with the Ming dynasty, and you want to switch side, it's better to switch side to somebody who has at least a pretense of legitimacy than to somebody who is like Lisa Cheng or Jiang uh, Zhong, you know, a, just a, 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 a criminal. <laughs> The Korean might have been listening. With the Korean, we have two invasions, and they might have been uh, mollified, if you like, and, and, and decided to, okay, we can deal with this person because you never know. They might actually um, grow into a legitimate power. And also some uh, rebellious uh, Jurchen or Manchu uh, leaders that had not yet joined the confederation that, or the state that, this is a painting, a, a Korean painting of <laughs> Manchu, Manchu horsemen that I thought was kind of funny. Now, the Mongols are a really complicated problem. I've written several articles on this, uh, you know, how Nuhachi managed to bring the Mongols over to his side. The Mongols were a serious military power still at that time. They could not be really um, fiddled with. Uh, and uh, there were lots of wars among the Mongols, so-called Chakar Wars, because they were um, initiated by a Chakar leader called Lig Dan Khan. But anyway, it was incredibly turbulent. So imagine this person, Nohachi, uh, He's fighting Korea, he's fighting China uh, to the south, Korea to, to the so southeast, oh, so, southeast, yes, and then the Mongols to the west. It's really not easy to uh, balance. So with the Mongols, he took a more diplomatic uh, approach. And so this, this particular um, propaganda might also have helped in his diplomatic effort to bring Mongol leaders over to his side. But when we look closely at the correspondence between Jurchen and Mongols, that's some, something interesting happens. Nohachi is not using the what I've called as the just war template, you know, the seven grievances. He's not accusing the Mongols that he's fighting against of the kind of crimes, I mean, yes, some crimes, some sins, but it's a very different type of language. Um, in uh, Mongol, he uses this word, yala which means, yes, crime, crime sins, you have committed several offenses against me but not, is not using the Manchu word that he uses, again, which is a reason for hatred, a really a strong word. Um, even when the Mongols violate some oaths, we have seen before with the, with the Chinese, that was a reason for going to war, the violation of a treaty. When the Mongols violate an oath, it's not a re Yeah, they are reprimanded, yeah, you shouldn't do it again, yeah, you're a bad guy, and so on, and so on. But they, are not going to uh, uh, evolve or, or develop into an actual conflict. So a, a, a declaration of war was really rare. Uh, so we, we have really a difference 
in the way Nohachi deals with, with the Korean and the Chinese, and in the way he deals with the Mongols. Two different types of rhetoric, two different type, types of uh, attitude. Um, uh, this is a letter sent to, by Hun Taiji to one of the Mongol leaders and says, you know, you have committed all these offenses. These are not offenses that can be redeemed by forfeiting property, you know, like give me a couple of cows or something. Uh, these are offenses to be redeemed by treating as an enemy those who reciprocate with hostility. So he's almost going to war. I mean, it's almost a declaration of war, but it doesn't go to war. So he stops short of doing this. This is a, another uh, interesting, which in my view means that we have prob probably to consider that there are two different political spheres. One is a sort of Mongol Manchu sphere that, uh, that, that functions in one way, and then there is another sphere, which is, if we want to call it a Semitic sphere, where the language becomes actually quite different. And, uh, and we have all of these examples from Chinese history that corroborate the theory. But the most interesting reception, in my view, is the reception by European Jesuits. This is something that I found rather really unexpected and somewhat... Um, now, um, you all know that the Jesuits have been uh, you know, very close to the Ming court, Matteo Ricci, etc., you know, in the early uh, 17th century. Now, for the Jesuit mission in China, the Manchu conquest was pretty much a disaster. <laughs> They had built their relationships with Chinese elites, emperors, and so on. I mean, it was not as smooth sailing. It was complicated. Uh, they have suffered some repercussions at, at different stages. But they were at court. They were in dialogue with uh, the most preeminent intellectuals uh, in, in China. And then the Manchus come, uh, you know, and, and are they going to survive? How are they going to survive? Uh, what does this mean for the Jesuits? Can they understand what is going on and accept it? So interpretations of the Manchu conquest really meant uh, at an existential, <laughs> as people say, uh, uh, impact on the, on the Jesuit and the Christian mission in, in China in general. Now, Martino Martini was uh, one of these missionaries in China, and he wrote the most important account, which was received, I mean, became a bestseller in, in, uh, in Europe, um, literally a bestseller. It was translated into 10 languages almost immediately. Um, he collected a lot of information about this Manchu conquest of China, and wrote this book that was published Im almost immediately after he came back to Europe. Uh, I think he came back in 1653-54, and it came out just the following year, beautifully illustrated. Um, so um, the stakes were high for the Jesuits in China. They had to decide whether this Manchu conquest and the Manchu dynasty, the Qing dynasty, was a legitimate dynasty or whether they were going to side with the remnants of the Ming, they were still fighting in the south. So where do they, could they position themselves? Now, Martino Martini made this claim that the Manchu conquest, the Manchu war, as it said, the title says, on the Manchu war, on the Tartar war, was a legitimate war, was a just war. So he makes this claim very clearly. Based on what? Well, based exactly on what Nuhachi had said many, uh, several, uh, two or three decades before. Um, three of the reasons for war by the Manchus were almost literally the same as those mentioned by Nuhachi in his declaration in 1618. So clearly Manchu propaganda had been quite effective in penetrating different areas and different audiences, 
and the Jesuits had picked up on, on, those, on those reasons, and we can see you know, that the Chinese governors were uh, oppressing the Manchu Nyocha, is means uh, Jurchen, uh, or Nohachi, it could be both actually. Um, the, second, uh, the second reason is that uh, you know, this, this failed uh, marriage uh, uh, promise uh, um, that we have mentioned before, this diplomacy with, with, uh, with the Mongols. And the third is uh, the um, assassination of the father of Nohachi that he refers to as uh, uh, the king of the Jurchen. Nyocher means Jurchen, Nyujer, Nyujer, right? Or Nyujen. So, um, so three of the, of the seven, or really six, but seven grievances mentioned by Nurachi are reported in this book for a European audience and, re and, and reported quite, quite literally, quite faithfully. Um. Now, the reason why this could be done, this operation, that is legitimating the Manchu conquest, is because the Europeans, in particular the Christians, had a very similar understanding of a just war. So it reason, th these reasons, you know, responding to a, 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 an offense or an injury that people had suffered, uh, or, uh, you know, there were three, three um, main principles that, that defined a war as just in the Christian and European context. One was that only somebody holding sovereign authority, that is a prince, a king, you know, a, an established uh, um, ruler in, in a territory, had the uh, uh, legitimacy to start a war. The second it was that there should be a just cause, like you know, responding to a and uh, the breach of a treaty, the invasion, the assassination, the, and so on. All of these lists that, that, that Nohachi um, uh, made before qualified as a just cause. And third was the intention. The intention should be a good intention, not you know, aggrandizing the monarch, you know, stealing from other people, but essentially restoring peace. And, uh, and, and this is what also Nurhachi had claimed, that his cause was just and he loved peace, but you know, his enemies were preventing him from doing so. So these three reasons, this is why the Manchu justification of the war against, against the Ming resonated quite strongly with uh, a Christian understanding of a just war. And just to make things even more, uh, I thought um, Magnus would appreciate the King of Sweden here, <laughs> Gustavus Adolphus, when it became uh, rather common in Europe in the 17th century also to issue a declaration of war, a manifesto of war, in which a king would assert the reasons why he was going to war. And if we look at some of the reasons that mentioned by the King of Sweden, they also resonate somehow with what Nurhachi had said before. Um, you know, m my friends and, 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 and relatives were oppressed, but I refused to take up arms because they loved peace. So did, uh, so did, uh, so said Nurhachi. Uh, an injured sovereign to whom uh, compensation has been denied as the right of punishment, etc., etc. So there, there are reasons why, very good reasons, why Martino Martini, an European of the early 17th century, would see the Manchus as, or the Manchu cause, as a just cause. I think I'm almost done. Yeah, yeah. 
So Nuhachi basically had done what any Christian king in contemporary Europe would have done. And for that reason, his war against China was regarded as just by Martino Martini. Um, by the way, Martino Martini also brings up divine providence. <laughs> Does it resonate with Tian, Tian Ming, <laughs> etc.? So it, it's, quite, uh, it's quite uncanny the way it, he constructs this argument based, based on proper uh, you know, sources, because the sources were exactly, he's not making up anything. So just to conclude, um, just a few points here. Now, um, some scholars have uh, questioned whether Nuhachi intended to conquer China. I believe that with the proclamation of war, especially you know, the seventh grievance that we saw, shows clearly that Nuhachi saw himself as a possible contender uh, in the future for China's throne. Now, he died before. Uh, the, the Manchus invaded, the, invaded China, but nevertheless, but nevertheless, there is here a kind of prefiguration of what happens, of what happens in 1644. Um, that doctrine also facilitated, I think, the acceptance of, uh, of the Manchus, also by the Chinese, who eventually had to, you know, side. Uh, in, at least in part, with uh, with this new uh, with this new um, new power, as a legitimate political alternative to the Ming, before the conquest, thus becoming a kind of magnet for disaffected generals, uh, officials, and so on, and also later, you know, facilitated the Ming elites transition from one dynasty to the other. Um, some foreign powers, like Korea, like uh, some of the Mongols and so on, also seem to accept the Manchus as the legitimate heirs to the Ming, uh, of the Ming dynasty after the conquest. And so it sort of smoothened the path or paved the way for a new world order. And finally, fixed. I think also this, this new doctrine... Uh, maybe, this is ma much more speculative, maybe it fixed the political space that the Manchus had to negotiate, that is an internal Manchu-Mongol political culture and a an kind of external Sinetic Chinese-Korean political culture um, uh, uh, in, in a way that uh, they could uh, um, actually deal with one side uh, in one way and with, the, uh, with China in a different way. Is it possible that this is also, um, we can detect in the distinction between the border regions and the core of China, uh, the different administration, the different systems, and the different political culture? Can we, can we see this just war differences or this, this, this ideological difference as something that also has some implications for later on? Well, you know, obviously, um, Qing, Qing dynasty is much bigger <laughs> than the Ming dynasty. And, uh, and uh, at some level, we need to explain why and how the, the Manchus managed to transition from a tribe to a nation to an empire, <laughs> you know, no less than when we talk about China in terms that are similar, um, you know, what did Tianxia mean for the Manchus? How did they understand these political concepts that were to a certain extent, were, to a certain extent borrowed from, from China? And what do they make of them? You know? um, what did they know about Chinese theory, <laughs> political theory also? And how did they harness uh, Chinese historical sources in their making of this of this claim uh, for uh, for the Tianxia, you know. Uh, so I think I think it's it's interesting to to see this side of the Manchu conquest as uh, something that can perhaps also explain better what happens later and you know how the governance. Uh, 
of, uh, of, of China is influenced by this early development uh, of, and these new, new doctrines that are uh, the player role in the rise of the Manchus. So here it is. Thank you very much.